Hi guys, I'm Shmi. Hello and welcome back to the channel where today is New Daily Shmi-mobile Day. Something under this cover, you can probably guess already exactly what this is. In fact, it follows on from a car that I owned almost a decade ago now. Time has absolutely flown by. Something fairly small, something Italian. We have a few other Italian cars here. A very big Italian car over there. Another Italian car lurking back on that side. Brad's little Italian car over there as well. But I want to pull the covers back and talk you through today what is underneath here to give you a very quick sneak peek. It's bright blue and we're gonna go through all of the details, the sound that this thing makes and take it for a first drive to tell you a little bit more. I am currently hiding inside this car. Let me start it though, because this is really quite unusual. An electric car that sounds like this. I get that Rockstar startup. It can actually be revved. That is a sound generator. But you know what? Let me press the button, pull this cover back and reveal for you the poison blue Abarth 500E Turismo convertible. Check this out. And <laughs> what an unusual thing to do. Yes, I know that's a bit strange, but here we have it. Welcome to the new daily Schmimobile. This is actually a long-term car from Abarth UK. I thought it would be a little bit of fun, but the 500e Turismo actually reminds me a lot of the car that I owned around 10 years ago. Back in 2013, I bought a then new 595C Turismo convertible. This is of course the completely new generation. It's electric. We've got a 42.2 kilowatt hour battery. We've got 152 horsepower, but still a tiny, tiny little machine, a super mini, if you will, a super mini electric, EV little car that I want to learn about. Today, we're gonna to go through some of the details, the spec, the Turismo specification, the upgraded fully loaded spec. We'll talk about what it's like on a first drive out, go for a little run with this thing, get the roof down, hopefully, if the weather is on side, and talk more about the plans that are ahead with it. But there's no denying this car, in this color looks pretty cool here at the Museum. Bang on theme, I would say. And something that when I saw it and heard it for the first time, I was mega intrigued by this sound generator and what it's about, what the story is behind that. So let's go through it all. The new temporary Schmimobile here, the Abarth 500e Turismo. Let's have a very quick overview and a walk around of the Abarth 500e, but I'm itching in literally a minute or two to get this out onto the road because at this point in time, despite it being here at the Schmuseum, I've not even turned a single wheel with it. So you're gonna come along with me for the first drive experience to see how it stacks up because I have very fond memories of the car that I owned a decade ago, the earlier 595C. In fact, I had bought that car a little over 10 years ago, ran it for about two years and four months, doing around 16,000 miles 25,000 or so kilometers in the meantime. And it was always very fun. It was very characterful. It appealed to the heart of a petrol head, which is where this is a huge departure. To a petrol head, this is like a stab in the back being fully electric. But bear with me because I'm intrigued to find out what Abarth have done with this in terms of the emotion and the Abarth sound generator that you've just heard. The idea of this bringing character to a full electric car in a way that nobody else has yet done. Now they spent over 8,000 hours analyzing and developing the speaker system from the record Monza exhaust, the upgrade exhaust that you could have with the previous generation to give this the soundtrack, which is quite unusual. Now, of course, it's based on the new generation Fiat 500e, which means it's grown in size and weight. It's longer, it's wider, it's also taller. The weight, despite being electric, is not that crazy. It's for the hatch, 1,410 kilos, curb weight, add 25 kilos to that if you have the convertible, as I did with my older 595C Turismo convertible, this folding fabric soft top that slides back to a middle position sitting here or down towards the lower level there, keeping the roof rails in place. So it's kind of like a very large sunroof, which is a very pleasant driving experience, it has to be said. Now, the Turismo nature is the fully loaded specification. In fact, there's only one paid option on this. Things like the upgrade wheels are standard, these 18-inch dual tone wheels, the diamond cut fascias over the satin gray, as opposed to the 
very standard 17 inches that you'd have normally on the car, but the only option is the paint color. There are five colors to choose from, two of which are charged, the poison blue as you see here, or the very bright luminous lime green that you can opt for as well, coming in at an on-the-road price of £41,795. Now, of course, electric, we have a battery pack, 42.2 kilowatt hours, which claims a WLTP combined cycle range of 150 miles, slightly more than some of its competitors, with 152 horsepower. Now, it might not seem a lot, but it is faster from zero to 62 miles per hour or 100 kilometers an hour than the older cars, taking just seven seconds. You have a few different driving modes. You have regular Turismo mode, you have Scorpion Street and Scorpion Track. Now, those change the amount of power. In the standard setting, you have 134 horsepower and 220 newton meters. In the Scorpion modes, you have the full 152 horsepower and 235 newton meters of torque. Now, I love the Scorpion graphics that you have here with those lime green elements. The Scorpionissima was the limited launch edition, if you will, of the Abarth 500e, whereas this is the regular production model, if you will. But the Scorpion shapes are actually carried through even to the design. If you notice the shapes of the claws, come and have a look at this around the front the grill openings, the cooling openings, actually reminiscent of that shape carried through. You can see just on the badge worn up there. Of course, vastly fewer openings than on the previous car, given the lack of relative need for cooling in comparison. From the key, you can actually open the roof of the car. If you unlock it firstly, just to show you, this is the key for the new car, 500 of course on the back. Give a press of the unlock button. The lights give you a little bit of a blinking pattern as they wake up and illuminate. And I think if you press and hold, you can then pop open the roof as well. Windows down, roof will fold back to the first position. So the fabric soft top just opening up with the wind deflector that you saw popping up at the front of that as well, giving an even calmer climate inside the cabin. To show you in here, handles are inside the bodywork, just there. Within, we've got a couple of different screens. If I step in here, the sound generator comes on when you start it. So one press, just to power it up very quickly. Everything obviously waking up, then foot on the brake, another press, and it fires up. Hey, welcome Shmi 150, it actually says there. That's unusual, isn't it? That is a very unusual sound. And that Rockstar-esque noise to signify that it has been switched on as well. We've got a couple of controls here for your driving modes. As I mentioned, your E modes, depending how you're set up. So you've got Scorpion Street, Scorpion Track being displayed on the dashboard and regular Turismo mode as well. Um, outside of that, fairly functional, familiar-esque format and style of the dashboard, controls on the steering wheel, big step up from the earlier car, huge step forwards. I mean, the dual tone stitch here, the Scorpion inlays that you have on the headrests. You do have seats back there. You can fit grown people in the back, although obviously not the hugest amount of space. And then you have the car where you can do this. I mean, that's not normal. We've got 700 or so miles on this particular example of the car, still fairly new in its infancy. We're gonna play around with this a little bit later on as well to go through the different settings, car settings, and just run through the different things that you can have, electric vehicle, performance. I guess this will give us some charts or things. There we go, technical gauges, battery level at 100%, thanks to our SeaTech smart charger that we have over on the wall over there, the SeaTech charge storm connected to, to keep this topped up. We've got 141 miles of range it claims at the moment, but you know what? I should probably stop playing with revving this here, go take it for a little drive and see what it's like. I have plenty of first thoughts to share with you about this. Some good things and some not so good things that we're gonna get to and some things that I think they forgot. But the first sensation is very much that you're in an Arbath, a very different Arbath because of course, the sound. Now, I had thought that would get more intrusive and drony than it does. We'll get more to that as we're driving through some twists and turns. And talking twists and turns, steering. Steering I want to talk about a little bit more. Now, don't get me wrong, inside here is a massive step up from the older car. It's a really quite nice interior for a Fiat or a Bath 500. I'm in Turismo at the moment, and I want to pop this up that way into Scorpion Street, at least for the time being. And there's plenty of go. It's really, I mean, it's instant torque, it's electric, right? And it's slightly quicker than the outgoing combustion engine versions. So when you're in 
either Turismo mode or Scorpion Street, you have one pedal driving, where effectively you lift off the throttle and the car decelerates you. It's using regenerative braking without touching the brake pedal. In the Scorpion track mode, it's all on you. There's no like braking assist, you know, the usual kind of freewheeling that the car would do. Now, when you're throwing it around a little bit, this is where the steering is the topic of conversation. It's very, very washy, very washy. Now, I've found already a couple of times I'm trying to correct myself and point it back. It's, it's still quite go-karty, it's still quite small, but it's certainly more positioned for cruising than the twisty tight roads that our baths, I would say, always excelled at driving through. It doesn't feel too heavy. It's not necessarily overly burdened. You're definitely conscious as you go over bumps that there's a little bit of kind of shaking and, and roll to it as you drive. And I wish that you did have a button to just turn on and off the sound if you want to, because you're aware that it's actually quite loud outside and you have to be stationary and go quite deep into the menu to actually turn it on and off. So it's not an easy thing. But there, I'm like, where's the steering wheel pointing? Is it going the way that I want it to? Obviously, these are cars that are more positioned to short distance hops, driving in and out of town, your daily commute, that type of thing, where I actually think it's a brilliant car for that purpose. You know, this isn't something that you want to take necessarily for a massive road trip or up and down a mountain pass. It's more for just being nippy, pointy, darty, you know, there. The positioning of the steering is just not really as honest as I want something like this to be. Inside, there's loads of practicality, loads of storage and spaces. I've got a little cubby for the wireless phone charger. You can pop lots of stuff in the armrest, the door pockets and the glove box. It just carries on a little bit more into corners than it should. And obviously, in track and street mode, you have that extra power that you don't have in Turismo. I'm very conscious of how quickly it's draining the battery. I've used vastly more than I would have expected if 150 miles is the range we're going to get out of it. In fact, a very quick calculation, we would get around 85 miles at my current usage rate. And I'm not going too crazy with it. I mean, maybe I should start driving adventurously and see exactly where it kind of ends up when we're ready to head back to base. So coming to a slower section, this is where I'm going to pop it back down, you know, oh, on pedal driving. It takes some getting used to because of the way it just backs off. Now, when you're on it a little bit more, driving in a sporty fashion, the sound, I would say, you almost just subconsciously, it's like there's an engine. There's an engine, it's doing what it does, you don't really focus too much on it. What's strange is like now, how much it burbles and how different it is to a petrol sound. I think what I appreciate the most with it though, is the attempt at doing something quite different. To take the original 595 sound with the record monster exhaust, and to feel like that's what you've got burbling away out of the exhaust pipes behind you and it's certainly a sense of it being behind inside it's very quiet it's very calm it's actually surprisingly comfortable and there's a good amount of space in here obviously we can open up the roof we could then pop it all the way down and i suppose given it's not raining we should be doing that and with the shape of this car and the roof line and the rails from a pillar b pillar and c pillar across you it's all very calm in the cabin, not particularly blustery. I'm gonna go back into track because the road is opening up. And then you hear the speaker outside. So you get more of it inside. It's just very, very bumpy down a road like this. And I'm conscious of the bumps here, for example. Oh yeah, it kind of bounces the car around. I'm surprised that it isn't more direct. I mean, I like the steering wheel itself, the way it's clad in Alcantara here and it's quite a small wheel, has some nice hand grips. Coming to the territory that a car like this is typically right at home, up some nice narrow countryside lanes because obviously it's still tiny. Okay, yes it's grown and it's 3 meters 87 long now, but it's still overall a pretty small car. It doesn't give me the uh, clenching moments down a lane like this that you sometimes have in some of the bigger cars that I'm more frequently throwing down these kind of roads. And the sound, as you can hear, like I said, you just kind of stop thinking about when you're going at it a little bit more. It's just that it's in the background as if you're in a combustion engine car, but with that torque, you know, you press your foot on the throttle pedal, it picks up and away it goes. And it does so really quite well. So I think for daily driving purposes, 
I don't really know what more I could want out of this type of car other than a slightly more dialed in drive. I think the interior is a big step forwards, the screens, the setup, the info, it's all very clever, it's all a nice generation shift you know, into the next model basically versus what we had before which was really around for a very 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 long time. Uh, despite it not being so blustery it is quite noisy with that open. I'm going to close it up, you can do it to quite a high speed, so even here, nice and easy, tuck that in, pops down the deflector at the front, <laughs> we're back to chucking it through the lanes. Now with the dual carriageway opening up, foot flat, both the sound and the power delivery are actually quite fun. I mean when you're used to driving lots of supercar type things, and to be honest I regularly daily my Focus RS or Lotus and Mira, which have substantially more power, I mean more than double the horsepower quite literally. It's a kind of step change to just get familiar with what the car is offering, but it throws through there pretty well, it has to be said. And at this speed, it's where I want to see what the sound is like a little bit more as we go 70 miles per hour. Yeah, as you hold it at 70 miles per hour, that's quite a loud exhaust sound. Now, the record Monza was always a loud exhaust, that's part of the fun. But I wish there was almost a button on the steering wheel where it's just off for the time being, or being able to adjust it and change the setting. Because arguably, if you're in an electric car, you should be able to enjoy the fact that it's a silent electric car. That's part of the point, and that's part of what makes them subconsciously quite pleasant cars to drive. They're effortless, you cruise, and obviously the idea is that if you have a charger at home, or as we'll charge up when we get back, you don't really ever have to stop at a petrol station, you just plug it in when you're at home, and off you go, job done. I've had a few electric cars that I've run. I had a Taycan Turbo S, I've run an electric Mini, I've also had a couple of electric Cupras, different things that have stopped by. So just getting a feel for different cars and different options, different use cases. I think one of the challenges for a small city EV like this is to have enough range that you can still use it for a longer journey if you need to. Not so much the short hops because you can charge every night if you're lucky to have a charger. If you don't, of course, don't just don't buy an EV in the first place. If you can't charge at home, don't buy an EV. That's the first and final conclusion I'm going to give you on that front. But if you do have a charger, you're not worrying about the day-to-day. -day. You're always going to have 100% because it's always going to be plugged in in your garage at home or in your driveway or wherever it is. What you need to worry about is can I get somewhere that's 60 miles away and back? And currently, the answer to that question is no. Um, I picked 60, obviously intentionally knowing that that was going to be on the edge of what this could normally achieve. It claims that you could get 75 miles away and back, but I think you're going to struggle to do much more than 55-ish. What I do like is pointing the wheels and going. It's more than enough for this type of use, and it's quite fun. You know, as a tech thing, it's quite fun. That's one way to look at it, rather than just the more traditional mindset. And I can imagine previous-gen Abarth owners look at this. I, how can how can that be done? It's blasphemy, literally. How is it possible to make this? But I think you have to rewind back, think about everything that has to change anyway. And the whole we're not going to get too political about that. And as an approach to a little electric sports car, it is good fun. It is good fun, and that's what it's supposed to be. Obviously, over the coming months, I'll drive it plenty more. It might become the puppy mobile. It might become puppy's car for a period to give us some feedback and just to really live with it a little bit more, to use it driving into central London, to use it for the commutes, to just do some more miles and get a better understanding as we're actually following a little Renault Zoe, which would be more of a car in the same segment as the regular Fit 500e rather than the Abarth. But we're away, we're unleashed, and we're going to head back to base because there are some more things I want to show you about this. We're going to skip the tunnel run because it's not going to work. Now comes plugging this in, normal, almost fuel filler position, just here, where obviously we have the 85 kilowatt charge option, given we're using the SeaTac charge storm connected to that we have here, where you can charge two cars at once. And I've got this wheel from my AMG GTR, which definitely needs 
a clean. We need to use some topaz wheel cleaner on that because it's dusty, cobwebby, and clearly hasn't had much attention in recent times. But we can charge at 22 kilowatts, I guess, with this, or maybe it's 11 for the built-in charger. Nice and simple. You get used to that kind of thing and it becomes very easy and second nature once you've been doing it a few times. That's now charging away. Of course, in here, given it's the convertible, there's not a huge amount of space in the back. 185 litres is your standard boot. You can fold down the seats and then you get 550 odd litres, which obviously is a ton of space. And arguably, because of the way the roof opens, you can easily just put stuff in and have a whole lot of stuff inside there. I've certainly done that once or twice with my original car back in the day. The hatch has your more traditional hinge from up top and obviously much more space as a result. Now, in terms of the car, you do get a little bit more used to the sound than perhaps I've been making out and it becomes a little bit more normal. It's just a learning experience. Every electric car manufacturer is obviously doing things slightly differently and there are different processes behind them and different understandings. Don't get me wrong, this is no longer as small as a 500 used to be. There's a pretty cool nod actually to the original, to the OG 500 in the door pocket here. It also says uh, that it's made in Turin, in Torino, in Italy, at the plant over there. And generally it's a very comfortable, nice interior. Where I perhaps struggle with this, and I think everybody would probably say the same, is that it's 42,000 pounds. 42,000 pounds gets you quite a lot of car, quite a lot of car indeed, especially if you're looking at prices of 695s or the older 595s, a used one, for example, on the market. And if you're a petrol head, I can see obviously why that would be appealing. I'm looking forward to spending more time at the wheel, getting more familiar with it, understanding it a little bit more. Like I say, in terms of the range, today's journey, we have gone well, we've used more than a percent per mile that we've traveled. So from 100 to zero would be in the 90s miles, 150 odd kilometers. That's not a long distance. I hoped it would be a little bit more. Obviously, I've been driving spiritedly down the country lanes, but let's be real, it's an ABAF, it's kind of what you're supposed to do. So real world to me, if you get 100 miles, you're doing quite well. Um, from my first experience, maybe over time, I learn a little bit more and play around with it a little bit more. I think it looks cool. I love the two colors that they offer. I like all of the nice design touches here, for example, in the tail lamp, the 500 graphic on the side, the scorpions that you have all around, the scorpion with the charging bolt that strikes through it. I think it looks like a modernized upgrade version to the Abarth, and I think that's overall been done really well. So I am looking forward to doing more miles with it. Obviously, this is the starting point. The car has just arrived. I've had my first drive in it and shared that with you. It's now on charge. We'll see how long it takes to charge up. But I think for today, that is more or less all. So I hope you like the new arrival. Like I say, it will be here for a couple of months as I drive, get familiar with this, drive it some more, and get back into the world of an electric car for a little bit in the near future. Despite the fact I'm about to go away for a couple of weeks to America and then a tour around Europe. When I'm here, this is the car I'm gonna be driving. That's it for now though. Thank you very much for watching guys. And I'll see you again very soon. Cheers.